Mr. Chairman, Professor Myers, um, you are here at the invitation of my Democratic colleagues, is that right? That's correct. Okay. Um, in his opening statement, my good friend Senator Whitehouse said, I want to quote, Reproductive justice is economic justice, close quote. Do you agree with that? I might, as an economist, use the word rights, but yeah, I do agree with that. Okay. That's not true for the baby, is it? Well, first of all, I would refer to a fetus. Not yeah, a but that's, well, a fetus. I refer to it as a baby. That's not true as a for the baby, is it? The evidence that I presented to you, Senator Kennedy, was evidence about measurable effects on the lives of women, families. Right, I got that part, but that's not true for the baby, is it? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't really understand. Well, it's the not question. true. Let me put it. Let me be I th clear. Uh, let me I'm back sorry. up. As an, as an economist, I measure effects using data. I'm not here to talk about ethics, assignment of right. personhood. That's not my Well, but you role. said you agreed with the chairman's statement that reproductive justice is economic justice. There is no economic justice for the baby because the baby's dead, right? I wouldn't refer. I, I, I don't really know how to answer your question. I would, you know, I would refer to the Was the, the baby fetus. dead or alive? I'm ref we're referring to a fetus. Okay. Is the fetus dead or alive? after an abortion. The fetus would be dead after okay. an abortion. All right. Do you, if, the, if the mother is healthy and the baby is healthy, do, do you support abortion up to the moment of birth? So I, you know, I think that's, that's a really hard question to answer because that just doesn't happen. You're asking me about something that simply doesn't happen. Well, it's I think, legal. I, it's, I will tell it's you legal, that It's legal in uh, Vermont, New Jersey, Oregon, Colorado, New Mexico, Alaska, and the District of Columbia. And, and uh, the loon wing of the Democratic Party supports abortion up to the moment of birth. So do you support that or, or oppose it? I don't think... Let me say, I'm here to talk about the economics of abortion. No, you're here as an expert. And I, as, I think you're you asking believe. me a question as a person, which I'll answer as a person. Okay, tell me as a person. Um, I, I will tell you as a person that I have ambivalence about abortion. I will tell you as a person, I haven't personally had an abortion. And I will also tell you as a person looking at the evidence around me and understanding how complex the decisions are that people face. Okay. I'm just simply uncomfortable I gotta move on, thinking that there's a simple I don't think, I don't answer think you're that applies answer to my everyone. Question. I trust um, women and their health care providers. Yeah, it's real simple. You either support abortion for a healthy mother and baby up to the moment of birth or you don't. And I, I don't think it's a difficult question. H how about you, doctor? Do you support if the mother is healthy and the baby's healthy, do you support abortion up to the moment of birth? So, Senator, you're using really inflammatory language to talk about a medical procedure, and it's not a simple yes or no. Not to mention when you make okay. statements like that, you're erasing the grief right. and the trauma you're, that my patients are You're not going to answer through. my question either, are you? It's not a question that can I think be I, I think I in know your answer. Way, I, think, I think I know your answer. Um, Mrs. Ford, okay, let's take a baby at 21 weeks. Hold up my, this is a baby at 21 weeks, okay? Um, the baby can feel pain, right? Yes. And the baby's pretty developed, right? Yes. And do you know the name of the procedure that the doctor would use to abort that baby at 21 weeks? I'm not a doctor, but I believe it's a DNR. It's called dilation and evacuation. Is that right? As far as I understand, yeah. Yeah, and first, uh, the doctor would, would, would dilate um, the cervix, and then the doctor would take what's called a, they, the doctor would call it a sofa clamp. It's really a pair of pliers with sharp teeth on the end. And without giving the baby any pain medication, the doctor would go through the vagina, through the uterus, 
and start tearing the baby apart. Is that right? As far as I understand the procedure. Yeah, and she might start with the legs and pull them out and the arms and pull them out, right? And then she might go for the, for the heart or the spine and just pull the baby out piece by piece. Is that right? Without giving the baby pain medication. That's what I understand the procedure to be. Okay. But then you've got to get the head out. The baby's dead, but maybe not. Maybe it's still in pain. But then you've you got to get the head out. And even with the cervix dilated, you've got to get the head out, which is hard. So then the doctor would go in and, and, and use those pliers to crush the baby's head. Is that right? That, as far as I And then she'd pull the head out, the crushed skull out, right? Mm-hmm. Senator Kennedy, your time has expired here. Well, you gave, you gave the others waiting. plenty of time, Mr. Chairman. Just letting you know your time's expired. Okay. You have other senators waiting. Well, you also, I was waiting when you were letting others. You, I'm sorry you don't want to hear about what happened no, I don't think anybody in an actual going, abortion, I but that's, I thought over. that was what we were here to talk about. No one else has gone over. Is, Some of the witnesses went a little bit long, but on both sides. So I thought we were I'm here about protecting mothers and killing babies. I'm going to turn to Senator Stabenow and Ms. Well, I'm sorry Phillips. you don't I'm want sorry to hear it. Had to take like place we've got in front a whole of you. Roster here. My apologies. Senator Lee, Dr. Myers, please proceed. Chairman Whitehouse, Ranking Member Grassley, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Caitlin Myers. I'm the John G. McCullough Professor of Economics at Middlebury College. As a labor economist, I study the causal effects of contraception and abortion access on economic outcomes. I'm not here as an activist, I'm here as a scientist presenting facts and evidence on the ways in which reproductive policy is also fundamentally economic policy. Women make up nearly half of the US labor force. Their increased work hours and earnings since the late 1970s have boosted the US economy by about 11% and prevented middle class household incomes from stagnating. The decision of whether and when to become a mother is the single largest economic decision many women will make in their lifetimes. Men and women's earnings trend pretty similarly right up until the point of parenthood. But when they become mothers, women's earnings fall off a cliff, declining by about 30% and opening a gender gap that persists even after the kids grow up and leave the home. Much of this gap is explained by the challenges women face balancing work and motherhood, and it is exacerbated by the lack of paid family leave and high cost of childcare. Of course, none of this implies that women, men, and society don't benefit great, greatly from children. I'm a mother of four, and for a time in my life, I was the widowed single mother of preschool-aged children. I have no doubt motherhood reduced my own economic productivity. I'm also sure it's entirely worth it for me and a decision that I would make again. But that's the point. The trade-offs and decisions about whether and when to become a parent are inherently personal and closely tied to our economic lives. And even the best laid plans of mice and men and let's add women can go awry. Abortion is a common reproductive health care need. Before Dobbs, nearly one million pregnancies ended in abortion each year. That's about 20% of all estimated pregnancies. At that rate, a quarter of women will obtain an abortion in their lifetime. And when they do, women are often in precarious and vulnerable situations. Most are young mothers, nearly three quarters are low income, more than half report a recent disruptive life event like the loss of a job or housing instability. The most frequent reasons women cite for seeking an abortion relate to their finances, aspirations, and ability to care for other children. This brings me to a key point. Access to contraception and abortion empowers women to plan their economic futures. Expansions in reproductive autonomy have gone hand in hand with women's economic progress. The introduction of the birth control pill in 1960, followed by the legalization of abortion in the early 1970s, accompanied a period of epical social and economic change marked by women gaining greater education, strengthening attachments to the labor force, entering new occupations, and increasing their earnings. Now, we all know the maxim correlation isn't necessarily causation, but in this case, it is. Ample evidence from multiple independent research teams uses statistical tools for causal inference that isolate and measure the effects of reproductive autonomy. The legalization of abortion rewrote women's lives. It reduced teen motherhood by one-third and reduced teen marriages by one-fifth. It reduced the maternal mortality of black women by 30 to 50 percent. 
It allowed women to complete their education and increase their earnings. And in doing so, it improved the lives of children, reducing the number living in poverty and the numbers experiencing abuse or neglect. As they grew into adulthood, these children themselves had higher rates of college graduation, lower rates of single parenthood, and were less likely to be poor. And it's not as though the salience of abortion access has gone away. For instance, one study finds that as a result of being denied a wanted abortion, women experience a 78% increase in past due debt and an 81% increase in adverse credit reports, like evictions and bankruptcies. Since the Dobbs decision, 14 states are enforcing near total abortion bans, impacting nearly a quarter of American women by increasing their travel distance to the nearest provider. The average affected woman now faces a journey of more than 300 miles one way. If any of my kids needed health care 300 miles away, I'd have them there tomorrow. But not everyone is in such a privileged position. I grew up in Burnsville, West Virginia and LaGrange, Georgia, and I know many people for whom coming up with the money, childcare, and multiple days off work on short notice is just not possible. But you don't need to rely on anecdotes. The data tell us that as much as a quarter of people in banned states seeking abortions do not find a way to travel hundreds of miles to obtain one. This is especially true for young women and women of color. And even for those who can make the trip, appointment availability has been severely constrained at many of the facilities on the front lines to receive them. The first set of post dobbs bans is estimated to have resulted in about 30,000 births in 2023 that would not have occurred absent state bans. These children were likely born into some of the poorest and most economically fragile families, many of which contain other children as well. Right now, the Dobbs story is an inequality story, not a macro-level shock story. But depending on future policies, this could change. If abortion access were further restricted, if Congress were to enact a national ban, then we would begin to play the 1970s in reverse, watching a reduction in women's capacity to fully participate in our nation's economy. To conclude, how everyone feels about the ethics of making contraception and abortion accessible, there is no denying that reproductive policies impact the economic lives of women and their families. Reproductive autonomy is inextricably linked to economic opportunity. Ford. <clears throat> Chairman Whitehouse, Ranking Member Grassley, and committee members, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Leslie Ford. I'm an adjunct fellow at the Center for Opportunity and Social Mobility at the American Enterprise Institute. My research focuses on helping vulnerable families find pathways out of poverty into opportunity. I'd like to make three points about vulnerable mothers experiencing normally an unplanned pregnancy. First, many women considering abortion face significant challenges, but abortion is not the answer. We have a duty to focus on real solutions. We should hesitate to make policy based on research that says abortion results in better outcomes for women, including the Turnaway study. It is scientifically difficult to isolate the effects of an abortion on women's long-term outcomes. At best, these studies only point to correlations. We should not draw conclusions from them. Instead, we should focus on the factors that lead women to consider abortion. Nearly 9 in 10 women who choose abortion are unmarried. Over half of women who choose abortion are in their 20s, and another 8% are in their teens. Many women who seek abortion do so because they fear economic hardship, and a majority of post-abortive women say that they chose that option because they experienced pressure to abort from the important people in their lives. We must address the socioeconomic challenges that push them towards abortion. This leads me to my second point. The safety net should be reformed to address many of the challenges that women considering abortion face. The safety net does robustly support vulnerable low-income mothers, giving them access to food assistance, cash assistance, health insurance, and in many cases, housing assistance and childcare. Yet despite good intentions, the safety net often impedes the, back, the path back to self-sufficiency. Most notably, the safety net broadly discourages work even though employment is the best way for moms to break the cycle of poverty and a key indicator of whether their children will end up in poverty as adults. Major programs also have benefit cutoffs or phase-outs that disadvantage married couples. In other words, the safety net traps people in poverty by discouraging both work and marriage. The safety net should be reformed to promote what social scientists call the success sequence. This is the completion of at least a high school education, full-time employment, and marriage before welcoming children. 
But even when an unplanned pregnancy may interrupt the completion of these milestones, there is still immense benefit to completing the steps after giving birth. When following up with mothers 15 years after a non-marital birth, there is nearly a 70 percentage point difference in the likelihood of being in poverty between those who complete the milestones and those who do not. We can and must do more to encourage these mothers to find the pathway back to self-sufficiency. My final point is that the government can't do everything. Mothers need the support of their communities. This means that child support services must do even more to ensure that non-custodial fathers contribute to their child's needs. We should also engage nonprofit community partners that support women through and after unplanned pregnancies. I'd like to highlight here the more than 2,700 pregnancy resource centers nationwide that provide wraparound services for mothers in crisis, including essential care from cribs to housing and so much more. I want to conclude by reiterating that unplanned pregnancies present real challenges for mothers, but abortion isn't the answer. We can and must support these women, empowering them to overcome the challenges they face. Reforming the safety net is a crucial step. Like every American, low-income mothers deserve and desire real opportunity for themselves and their children. And it's absolutely essential to support mothers with the power of community. All mothers, but particularly single mothers, deserve a consistent and supportive community to walk alongside them, helping them welcome their children into the world, and giving those children the brightest future possible. Thank you, and I look forward to answering your questions.